Oh, you're backing up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let me pray for us, and then Cade's going to take us to, to some time of worship, and we'll come back and hear Brian have a time of prayer. But let me pray for us this morning. Well, Father, we uh, come before you this morning just to say thank Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. For the day you that, that you're giving us. Thank you that the sun will rise and the skies will blue, or maybe they'll be gray today. We've got some rain, but we're so grateful for another day you're giving us. Thank you for this weekend. Um, that we get to just to have an extra day to just celebrate with, with family and friends, um, to just to be in your goodness and your grace. Uh, thank you this morning, Lord, that you uh, have allowed uh, such pandemic to, to be upon us um, so that we can grow closer to you. That's my prayer this morning, Lord, that all this time that we've had, even through frustration, even through the struggles and challenges, that we would just... Um, hold on to you and, and be reminded that uh, you are a provider. You're, you're the beginning and the end, Lord, and you are our daddy, our Abba Father. So this morning as we worship, we pray that you would help us to, to align our hearts with your heart, to uh, turn the world off and to simply just be in your presence. Um, and thank you for coming. You would allow your words to be spoken, that he would share his heart with us, and we would be encouraged. We love you, we praise you, and we uh, give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, be, go ahead and kill your, your audio and your video as uh, Kate sends us to worship. I just wanted to say a word, too, before we go to worship. We talked a little bit about this last night in our journey group, but any guys on here that have served in, man, armed forces, uh, local police, um, any, any line that allows the rest of us to live in, uh, in the freedoms that we do, man, we just say thanks, uh, this morning. And we're just talking about how, um, that's what Jesus did. He laid down his life so that we could live a life of freedom. So as you think about the, uh, semblance of Memorial day this weekend, man, just let that cultivate just a heart of gratefulness um for jesus as well guys we love you we're grateful you're all on here and uh, i will get this uh get this worship going
Now, if that's not backwoods worship right there, I don't know what is. Straight from the woods of Arkansas, Brian. All right, guys, unmute yourselves. Hope you guys enjoyed that. More of that kind of worship. All right. <laughs> well, we're working on it, Cade. <laughs> well, guys, uh, this morning, uh, it, it really is a humble privilege, and there's so many of us from, from Chris to Gordon Polly to so many of you guys could say a lot about this guy who's going to share with us. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, I know this anchor would not exist if it wasn't for – his heart for ministry and his warehouse and just a few of us being willing to get up at 6 a.m. and just say, okay, God, have your way. So here we are 10 years later and um, God's still moving and we're very, very grateful. So um, here's what I can say just briefly. Um, I know above all else that, that Brian Craig is one who uh, embraces and lives in a life of abiding. Um, there's a guy I've ever met that uh, goes to the foot of the cross daily, moment by moment, hour by hour, uh, with, with five girls at home, I'm sure, every second. Uh, that's Brian, and um, he's a joy to be around. He's a dear brother to so many of us and a, 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 a more than a friend, and uh, I just love him. I love his leadership and what he's doing with influencers, uh, not just uh, – statewide or in this country but around the world and and god is really moving in an amazing way so um i'm so glad he said yes uh, to uh stepping out and uh, i'm glad i've had the opportunity to do life with them but i also know this about brian that is he's an incredible husband to his wife missy and he's an amazing dad to four girls um he's just a he's just a, a brother that that lives and breathe um, walking with the Lord. And I'm grateful that he went searching so many years ago for something more than just accountability. Um, you know, he's a guy, some of you know the story, he's a guy that was very involved with uh, Promise Keepers. And, and he saw that there was a, a greater need than guys just, you know, keeping things in the surface. So um, I, I'm so humbled to have the, the privilege and, and, and really humble privilege to have him this morning come and share his heart of what the journey's meant to him. So, Brian, love you. Um, thanks for being here with us. It's all yours. All right. Thank you, Frank, so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for asking me to do this because uh, it caused me to go and search my heart and kind of dig into uh, – just some things that the Lord has done. And, and, and sometimes we forget, you know, we forget all the beautiful things that God has done and we already take it for granted. Um, so I got to kind of go on a heart search and go back in time. And I, I have to give you a little bit about where I was before in order to help you appreciate what the journey's done for me. So, so I'm going to just, I'm going to take you back a little bit. Um, I just want to tell you that um, when I was 13 years old, I made a decision for Christ and it was a, it was a very real moment. It was at a, um, it was over at the first Baptist broken arrow at a tent revival that they used to do tent revivals in the, in the back parking lot. And I'd been wrestling with this thing called accepting Christ. And, uh, finally, even though I didn't really understand it, I, I prayed a prayer with a man and asked Jesus to come be my Lord and savior. And it was very real. I was a blubbering young 13 year old. And, uh, so I, I just know it was real. And I know it was real because, because even though I had no guidance, nobody reinforcing it, uh, nobody discipling me, nobody uh, walking with me. I was never part of a, a youth group. His light was in my heart, All th even through, you know, through my years of uh, being a crazy high school teenager and partying all the way into college at Oklahoma State, um, uh, and then met my wife Missy there, and then on into the working world. But just really, uh, I would say I was a believer for sure, but I wasn't a follower of Jesus because I had no idea what that looked like. So it wasn't until 30 years old. And so I'm going to take you back to 1996 for a second. Uh, I was, we had, had just joined Kirk of the Hills Presbyterian and uh, it was the first church that really, uh, really challenged us uh, to get into God's word, uh, was challenging us to this different life, a more of a deeper walk with Christ. 
uh, I still didn't have any clue what it looked like and, and didn't understand it. But I went to this Promise Keeper event. It happened to be the same year that we had our first child, Natalie. And uh, so God was starting to get my attention. Um, and, uh, and I just saw this in the bulletin and I decided, you know, I liked football. I liked sports and it was at Texas Stadium. And I loved, I appreciated that Bill McCartney, I knew who that was, the you know, founder of, of uh, or the former coach of University of Colorado. So anyway, I went to this deal and, and God really rocked my world and just kind of opened me. It was like every speaker was speaking to me and it was like it opened me up to this uh, new life and something more out there. So I really started my journey, real journey of trying to be a follower of Christ there. Got into an accountability group, uh, started reading God's word for the first time. Um, and I was just really chasing after God at that point. I, instead of the things I was chasing after, I really turned and I started chasing after God. And then, and over time, God blessed that. And he, and he put me in leadership positions at my church in charge of the men's ministry and led many men's uh, retreats, uh, started kind of leading our small group. Um, I would lead prayer groups. Uh, I'd lead Promise Keeper trips because I thought everybody needs to go to Promise Keepers because you got to get a taste of what I got a taste of. Um, so I just was really busy doing a lot of activities and chasing after uh, trying to be useful to God, if you will. And uh, somewhere along the way, me and a few other guys started uh, Tulsa Men of Christ, if you guys remember that. And that was really just de designed to be a network of men that we could kind of inform about good men's things going on, including Promise Keepers in Tulsa and other places and send them a daily scripture every day and um, all those kind of things. But you know, in, in light of all that, there was still something missing. I kind of think about uh, the song uh, has always resonated with me by U2. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You know, there was something I was still longing and looking for, and I didn't really know what it was. And I look back and I was just thinking about uh, just a few observations back at that point. Events were good, but they weren't lasting. Most groups that I've been part of were horizontal, and they, but they, and they weren't life-giving, really. Um, and I just observed men and not being judgmental, but I looked around at most men I knew in the church. And, and by the time, and for, after a while, I met a lot of men from different churches. So it wasn't just limited to Kirk of the Hills. It was everywhere. Most men I saw, and I love the quote, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And I think that's what I felt I saw. Uh, most men were double-minded. Um, they, they weren't consistent in their lives. Most men were not in God's word. I could just tell, because you'd talk about God's word and they kind of like, would say, yeah, I probably should do that. Um, I do think a lot of men are, were orphans, are orphans. They weren't, they didn't understand that they had a heavenly father that had adopted them. But let's not point at everybody else. I'll tell you where I was at that point. Even though I was doing all this activity for the Lord and felt like I was doing a lot of good things and was useful, I was still wrestling with sin all the time, always wrestling with sin. I was also wrestling with a calling into ministry, calling into a deeper calling. And that, and I was just wrestling with it all the time. Anyone who knows me well knows about that. Um, I was wrestling between the world and the word. <laughs> you know, I just, I still kind of held on to this idea of what the world told you success was and what the, the great life, the good life is. And then this life of the word of sacrifice and, and laying your life down and carrying your cross. I didn't really get it. I was just wrestling all the time. So I, I want to, I, you know, I dug into my box of journals and I pulled out my journal just to give you a little flavor for where I was. And this is back, I'm going to take you back to July 4th, 2005, 4th of July, 2005. And I, and I, the night before I had just watched the movie National Treasure. You guys remember that movie with Nicolas Cage? Anyway, let me just read it a little bit. I'm on my own treasure hunt. And uh, it's interesting that today's key passage was John 15 about the vine for that passage in Bruce Wilkinson's book, secrets of the vine profoundly influenced me and launched my treasure hunt. It was the idea that God wanted to bear much fruit in my life. I wanted to reject the idea for the voices of condemnation and discouragement and fear always try to hold me back. But God awakened me to a vision that I had a treasure to find. It's strange how the thoughts I've been wrestling with are all culminating in this movie. I've been desperately seeking independence. I've been forging a path toward this freedom. Like Ben Gates in the movie, he says, when you go on the treasure hunt, few will understand or join you. It doesn't make sense. But uh, one of the big steps in my treasure hunt was stepping out of the door of Sigma Sales, which was the business that I, that I was running. I just felt like I, he was calling me out of it, which I didn't fully understand. 
On the other side of that door, more clues await. In the practical realm, however, I have financial considerations, business considerations. I want to be wise, but I also want to find the treasure. I'm believing if God created the treasure, he told me about it and is guiding me toward it. Doesn't he want me to find it? So what is this treasure? It's where my gifts, passions, and desires line up with God's will for my life and where they meet the world's needs. So then um, let me fast forward forward over to uh, November 3rd of 2005. And I kept, it's interesting that I kept talking about this treasure hunt because uh, I don't know if you remember this, but on Rocky's book, Journey to the Inner Chamber, the byline is discovering the treasure of the universe. Uh, and this is all before I ever even knew anything about Rocky or the journey. But I met Rocky because of my involvement with the PK event over here in Northwest Arkansas. And I, I had been driving, I'd helped plan that event and I was driving over two or three days a week to Northwest Arkansas meeting with businessmen and prayer meetings with the founders of Dayspring Greeting Cards. And I was getting to know all these people over here. I didn't even know anything about this world over here in Northwest Arkansas. And Rocky was over here starting the journey, you know, and I had no idea who Rocky was. But uh, there was a day, November 3rd, 2005, that I drove over to Salem Springs, Arkansas, to sit in on a meeting uh, of this process called The Journey. And uh, Rocky was there, and there was a bunch of guys uh, having a meeting. And I wrote, today I was beckoned to go to the promised land, Arkansas. I used to call it the promised land when I would drive over because it was so pretty over here. I knew I was supposed to come. Rocky confirmed it. I'm seeking clarity once again in so many thoughts and frustrations. I'm sitting here on this journey group, and the topic is personal abandonment. One man talked about how unanswered prayer shows you a lot about yourself. The answers to every prayer is yes, no, wait, or I can't. What am I doing to prevent his working? So they were talking about... Um, God is able, and they're talking about what's blocking your communion with God. And I'm, I'm just sitting in, you know, me and a few other guys were just sitting in on this meeting, and Rocky was there, and I ended up going and talking to him afterwards or whatever. Um, and so, uh, you know, this idea, he kind of got to know me, and this idea was birthed that maybe, maybe we could do a journey group in Tulsa, because he seemed to think that uh, I was hungry, and there was a lot of men over there. So uh, I'm still wrestling, and then you go to November 23rd of 2005, I wrote, these mornings, uh, I open God's word with great anticipation. The key verse is loud and clear this morning. As a matter of fact, it's on the page before this on my last journal entry. Psalm 37, four, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That verse has spoken to me time and time again. As I sit here this morning, I think I've gotten this verse backwards. Give me the desires of my heart and I will delight in you. What a selfish thought. My desires may not be pure or line up with his desires unless I deeply delight in the Lord first. I feel certain that the journey is what I need. I don't need another feel good, pump me up seminar or conference. I need to learn how to delight in the Lord. I need to spend more time in his love. I'm so performance oriented, just like Rocky described himself when he was my age. He's so much like me. I've got to spend more time with him. He can teach me much. So this is back, you know, in the early days. And so, let me take you to February 21st, 2006. It, we were doing the final uh, introductory session of the journey. We'd assembled some guys together. So I wrote this February 21st, 2006. The journey grows ever closer. Today's our final introductory meeting. The schedule's been created. The men are falling in line. And I see God forging a path to great blessing. As Rocky commented last week, it seems a great tremor is about to shake Tulsa. However, it must stay underground as the pressure builds until just the right time. I see God calling the men forward. I see him equipping me to lead. It was no accident that Evans was put in my heart to be my co-leader. It was Providence. I felt it and I see it now. I see guys like Jimmy Rogers and Todd Kramer, and I know God is birthing something huge. I didn't even know that I'd been uh, searching for a model to help other men, but God did. More confirmation for the journey. It's the destiny of my heart's desire to help men. Big surprise that I wrote a piece one time uh, describing the spiritual walk and I entitled it, The Journey. <laughs> it's all coming together. The treasure hunt is on. I don't know what to make of the testing and the emptiness and disappointments this past year. I'll never fully understand or grasp God's love and purposes. But as Paul, I strain ahead with perseverance and strength. I wanna bear fruit first and foremost in my family. So anyway, it was, uh, I look back, it was just a treasure to go back and think about those times and kind of where I was and all this wrestling that was going on and God, everything I had been doing, God was setting me up 
to meet Rocky and find out about this journey process. And uh, so, so let me say, what has this meant to me since? A lot, a lot has happened since that first journey group back in 2006, a lot has happened. And I was just trying to think about it as I summarize it. <clears throat> I think I want to put it this way. I, I was reading a verse the other day. I was really chewing on this, but Acts 8, 14 through 17 says, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they'd only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid their hands on them and then they received the Holy Spirit. And here's what I think. I think there's so many men out there that uh, were like me. They, they have received Christ. They, they've asked Christ in their heart. And when you ask Christ to come in your heart, he comes. And since Christ and the Holy Spirit are one, the Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive him. But there's more. There's more. And, you know, different Bible scholars have talked about this more. And, they, and it has to do with the Holy Spirit. There's, there's a reference called being endued with the Spirit which means to endow or provide with a quality or ability. You've heard being empowered by the spirit. You've heard of being filled with the spirit. If you've been through the journey, you know the sailboat analogy and all that, being filled with spirit. Uh, they talk about being imparted the spirit, being bestowed the Holy Spirit. There's another uh, scholars that talk about a released Holy Spirit, a released spirit in your life. Um, Titus 3, 4 through 6 says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Rocky, in the journey, he, he labeled it enabling the Holy Spirit. If you abide in Christ, you start bearing fruit, which enables the Holy Spirit to come alive in your life. So as I think about, I just summed it up, the journey helps believers learn how to abide so they can now live spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-released, spirit-renewed, spirit-enabled lives. And that's, that's the key. I mean, that is, you know, when you start living a spirit-led life, your old self gets put to death and you start living a new life. And it takes you on all sorts of adventures. You like going like Chris and I can talk about going into some strange hospital situations and praying for sick people or dying people. Uh, you do some strange things with your money when you're living a spirit led life. You, you don't really care that much about saving up X amount of dollars for your retirement. You start saying, who cares? It's all yours, Lord. You start giving, giving things away sacrificially. You start putting your family, your, your wife ahead of you. Instead of wanting her to serve you, you start putting her ahead of you. You start putting your kids ahead of your own needs. Crazy things happen when a man starts following the Holy Spirit because it's the heart of God living his life through regular guys like us. Um, I just summed up a couple benefits of the journey, what the journey has meant to me. It's helped me see that I'm not just a servant, but a son. The journey has helped me find the real church described in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Prayer, fellowship, the word, meeting each other's needs, communion with the spirit, power. The journey has helped me love my wife more unconditionally and sacrificially. The journey has helped me show my kids so much more grace and to help feed them God's word. The journey has helped me find my spiritual gifts and has fanned into flame, fanned them into flame to use them more boldly. The journey has helped me quit trying to live by the world and squeeze my faith into that worldview. It's helped me to die to the old worldview and live a radical spirit led life. I finally have found the abundant life that Jesus talked about and it has nothing to do with money. The journey helped me find my purpose and contentment and peace and an end to the wrestling that I talked about that I went on for so long. And the journey has given me an incredible tool and a platform to live out my heart to help change the world one man at a time. And I'm gonna close with this uh, thought. I, this really hit me the other day. I was, just, I was thinking about the influencers organization and you know, wh where are we heading? And this thing just keeps growing. And, and, you know, I'm the organizational leader. So it's like, wow, we need to get some more organization, maybe another layer of leadership or oversight to help all the regional directors. I need to, we need to make Frank a, a national director, you know, and let him start whatever, you know, I was just thinking about these things corporately, if you will. And God kind of reminded me of our true org chart in influencers. 
and he gave me a vision and it's an upside down org chart and it's Jesus the vine with the branches coming off of it. And there's a branch called Influencers Tulsa. There's a branch called Influencers Northwest Arkansas. There's a branch called Influencers Orange County, Influencers Bakersfield, California. And it's all organic. But if we get away from the, the vine, the source, the fuel, the power of this ministry, if we go try to create fruit or create branches, we'll snuff the whole thing out. But if we stay close to the vine, it's beautiful things happen. And I was just having this strange thought, but I was thinking about this. The whole thing started in a garden. This whole thing started with one man in a garden, Adam, with Jesus in a garden, in perfect oneness with the Father, perfect unity with God. It was beautiful. He was abiding with God every day. And then, as you know, sin screwed the whole thing up, and he and his wife got kicked out of the garden. And swords were drawn, and they were preventing anybody from going back in. And then you fast forward so many thousands of years later, and Jesus gives him the last word, and he takes him back to a garden image and says, I'm the vine, and you're my branches. Come back to me. And then he's like saying, come back to paradise. Come back to where you all began, and, and all of a sudden, some beautiful things will happen. And then all of a sudden, your life will help grow this garden called the kingdom you know, and then, and then you'll reach other people and you'll bring other people back into this, into this communion. And that's what the journey has been all about. Um, and that's what happens. You know, you guys are your own, you guys are branches. I'm a branch and God intended for us to bear fruit, you know, as you guys know, and the first place he bears it, it, it I think about our families are like gardens too. And so we are like, we're not only branches, but we're like assistants to the gardener. Uh, to help tend to the garden. So, so we got to be tending to our gardens at home, you know, making sure our wives are doing okay, making sure our kids are doing okay, you know, seeing where some pruning is needed, seeing where some fertilizing is needed, where some watering is needed. And, uh, and that's kind of what we do. Um, but also another, the last thing I'll say is uh, there's a gardening, uh, another gardening reference, if you will, or to a tree. And this is in Isaiah 61. I'll close with this. And this is what I think has happened through the journey, is happening through the journey and through, through abiding. Uh, this is uh, in Psalm, uh, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And as I look at all you guys, I see oaks of righteousness. He has raised you guys up. He's raised me up. And we people are drawn to us because they say there's something about those guys and I want what they have. And uh, so I just say, keep being oaks of righteousness, keep, keep staying close to him, and you'll bear the kind of fruit that he wants. You'll understand that verse, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It only comes there. We, if we go try to manufacture it, if we go try to do a bunch of good works, you'll miss it. But if we get out of the way and come close to him, then we become those oaks of righteousness. That's all close. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Wow. That was awesome, Brian. Thanks for sharing your heart. What a beautiful sure. picture. Guys, what a beautiful picture of what, what the Holy Spirit can and will do in your life if you, you know, there, there's a lot of ifs we can read through Scripture if we're willing to step out of the way and be all in. And that's really what Brian is describing to us this morning is um, when a man is willing to be all in, um, God begins to to transform you from the inside out and you can't stop that transformation. It's, it's the work of the Holy spirit. So thanks for that, Brian. Well guys, um, I, uh, I wanted to take a second and put Gordon Polly on the spot. Gordon, can you unmute yourself? Um, all of you, uh, it, it, you know, last week we all had the privilege to pray for Gordon. It was a, 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 a crazy world spin things of events that happened to Gordon and 
Uh, nobody can speak about this better than Gordon can. So doing and and um, we would love to pray for you before we go into our prayer rooms. Good. Thank you. Um, you want me to share a little bit, Frank? Yes. Yes, okay. please. Oh, well, Saturday before Mother's Day, um, found myself in the hospital Saturday evening with some uh, pain in my neck, a little bit of pain in my chest, and um, they admitted me. And that Sunday morning, a uh, te technician came in to do an echocardiogram of my heart. And he, as soon as she was uh, taking a look at my heart, she left the room for a couple of minutes, which um, I didn't necessarily appreciate. I thought, okay, that's not cool. But um, she came back in and um, soon after she was in, um, a cardiologist came in while she continued with the echo. And he said, you've got a, a dissection of your aortic valve and we need to take you from Hillcrest South to the Hillcrest Main Hospital immediately and do open heart surgery and repair that. Um, and thankful to God, they happened to have a surgical team, a uh, cardiovascular thoracic surgical team that was there at the hospital um, at Hillcrest, Maine, just wrapping up another emergency surgery. And he said, we've got a surgical team there. They are um, ready to go. And, um, we need to get you over there immediately. And I, I have my wife, the kids, they had come over to the house for Mother's Day, so they were on the other end of the line, and so they heard that. They came up to Hillcrest South and um, said goodbye to me as I was being loaded into the ambulance. And um, got to Hillcrest South, they immediately prepped me for surgery, and um, within 15 minutes I was, um, laying on the operating table, ready to go under for a seven hour open heart surgery procedure. Um, sure didn't see that one coming, you know? Um, try to stay healthy, um, but you know, you never know what God has for you. And um, I said, okay, Lord, if this is it, then, then I'm ready, you know? I, I had no fear whatsoever. Um, but at that point, most people who um, have that same situation don't even make it to the hospital. They um, die before they get to the hospital. And so at that point, I knew God wasn't done with me. And um, that I was going to make it through the surgery. I was going to recover. And um, I had to look forward to whatever God has, has for me moving forward. And as it relates to what Brian was just talking about, to, to be part of that oak of, of the vine, you know, that's, that's continuing to do God's, God's will in our lives. Um, so I had seven hours of surgery, um, spent all of last week in ICU. Uh, they did a great job caring for me, but as you know, um, family can't come up and see you. Um, it just so happened that one of the doctors who works on the ICU floor is the son of a guy who I led in a journey group back about four or five years ago. And he comes in and he says, hey, I think you know my dad. Well, there is an immediate connection there between <coughs> me and Dr. Betts, and Dr. Betts just um, did a wonderful job communicating to my family what was going on. Um, he, he, he just continued to uh, communicate to the family and um, gave them a lot of peace about the situation. Um, fortunately, I could FaceTime my family, but uh, nonetheless, they were... Um, pretty anxious all of last week. But, um, you know, last Friday morning at this time, I was sitting there in the ICU and AFib with my heart racing, 
Um, that's one of the things that happens post open heart surgery is your heart gets into this irregular rhythm and I'm sitting there with my heart rate at about 144 beats per minute and uh, spent the next almost 48 hours, uh, actually right at exactly 46 hours with my uh, heart and AFib. Um, but I was laying there in the hospital bed Sunday morning, 2.30 in the morning, and I just felt that I had gone out of AFib. I felt the peace of, of, of my body not being in AFib any longer. I looked up at the heart monitor, and there was just a nice steady 73 beats per minute. And um, I knew at that time that I had an opportunity to maybe go home that day. And uh, sure enough, they let me come home on that day. Um, and, and so I, I got home to my, to my family, to my bride. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I, I, I think I'd like to say as well about the whole situation, you know, you're, you're, you're laying there in the hospital bed and, and I knew I had people praying for me. Um, I knew I had journey brothers who were praying for me, um, family um friends but what i've learned since is um i had the body of christ praying for me um it, it was it was much broader than i could have imagined um, because somebody would tell someone else and they didn't know me but they said i'll pray for him and and I've thought afterwards, you know, how could not God keep? How could God not keep me here with all these people that were praying for me? But you know, if it wasn't His will, it wasn't. Um, but you know, just uh, the realization now at the end of it all, um, as I recover now at home, that I saw, I, I, I see, and I am um, experienced the body of Christ at work. Um, and so many of you guys were a part of that. And I appreciate it so much. Well, Gordon, we are uh, glad to have played a part, man. We're glad that we got to, to see what only God can do in your life last week. And um, we're just we're just rejoicing with you that you're with Thank us. You. And you you couldn't have said it better. Um, he's not done with you, and and your story continues, and a lot of lives are being changed changed and touched because of it so thanks for being one to share this morning um brian thanks for being on here this morning i hope it's been a blessing to all of you but um i will say what we say every friday um you know the next little bit is a time for you to be able to jump on a prayer room with some guys you may have not prayed with before we let the computer randomly do it um i challenge you to stay on um, there's always a few of us that want to bail out because perhaps we're afraid to share our burdens. Um, and, and, and I say this every Friday, you know, if you're on this call this morning and life is good for you, your marriage is good, everything's good for you, you haven't lost your job, everything, hey, praise God for that, right? But, but there is a, a really good chance with this number of guys on the call, there's some of us on here that you, you're not sure how you're going to take your next breath because you're dealing with something or there's a storm in your life or a challenge in your life or something going on. And, and scripture is very clear that we're to share that with our brothers. We're to, we're to allow um, each other to lift each other up, pick each other up, each other's arms up and don't do it alone. We weren't created to do life alone. So um, this is an opportunity that you get to, to let your brothers in Christ help lift you up and carry you. And his, you know, scripture is very clear that his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And we get to do that, guys, every Friday. So don't miss that uh, as you start your Memorial Day weekend. So um, thanks for being here again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next Friday. 
Uh, Brian, thanks again for jumping on here. And so many of you who joined us this morning from all over town, all over the country, um, it's a blessing to have you. And um, I will send you to your rooms. You'll get a screen that says click to, to join, and it'll stay open as long as we need to. Um, and uh, thanks again, Brian, for being with us. God bless you guys, and, and God bless you men who, who have served sacrificially so that we can have the freedom that we have today. Um, and remember those that have gone before us who have paid the ultimate price. Reach out to that family today. Say thank you to them. Um, love you all. God bless you. And I'll get you guys into a room here in a second.